My name is Dara Conduit. I'm an Associate Research Fellow here at MASSEP and the Alfred Deakin Institute, and I will be chairing Marika's seminar today. Um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people, uh, and that this land has always been and will always be Aboriginal land. Um, we're joined today by nearly Dr. Marika Sosnowski. Um, who is an admitted lawyer and researcher at the University of Melbourne. Uh, her primary research interests are critical security studies, complex political order, local rebel governance and legal systems. And approximately six days ago, she submitted her PhD on civil wars in Syria. <laughs> anyway, we're very lucky here at MASSEF to benefit from her years of research. And she's going to share some of her findings about um, ceasefires and political governance issues that she discovered while doing her extensive research on Syria. Um, so we might talk for, or Marie might talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then we will be have questions. Um, and lunch will be served at 12, so you'll have plenty of time to chat to her then. As well, floor Great. is yours. Thanks, Dara. Um, thanks all for coming. It's really nice to see you and to share my research with you. I feel for MSF, I feel like it's kind of like a long time listener, first time caller uh, scenario. Um, I've been coming and part of MSF for a long time, so it's really great to uh, be able to present this work to you today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and to acknowledge that. Um, like many of the people that I met over the course of my research on the civil war in Syria, they continue to fight for rights that really shouldn't uh, have been that hard, um, that, you know, shouldn't be that hard for them uh, to get. So the story I want to tell you today um, actually begins about five years ago when I was part of a project, an international development project that aimed to support the what was then called the moderate opposition uh, that was uh, working in northern Syria developed local systems of governance. And that essentially meant local councils, a police force, and judiciary services. When we spoke to the Syrians that were involved in those projects uh, at the time, uh, basically they said that the projects would be going really well, and then Assad warplanes would come over and bomb them, um, and everything would kind of go to pieces. So it got me thinking back then that if those kind of war planes could be contained and stopped for a period of time with a ceasefire, for example, how might those systems of local governance develop further? And that, does, that thinking was basically what spurned the two major research questions of my PhD. And they were essentially, quite simply, what is a ceasefire exactly and what does it affect? What are its ramifications in practice? And my hypothesis, and the hypothesis of most of the literature uh, that I had read about ceasefires, were that essentially they were, um, they were seen as a way to stop or limit violence for periods of time. Um, and the thinking was that then they could potentially have relatively positive consequences for things like local uh, level governance development and things like humanitarian access as well. I wanted to look a, bit, a little bit more closely at this, this proposition and to kind of interrogate that a little bit more. Were ceasefires really just at, uh, the definition, one of the definitions, and they're all quite similar, was a temporary cessation of violence that does not settle the larger conflict but is intended in a step in that direction? So very much the emphasis was on stopping violence. Or were they something actually a little bit more than that? So, over the past sort of three and a half years of my PhD, what I did was I authored a number of articles uh, on exactly these two topics, basically. And what I want to do to, for you guys today is outline the findings of four of those articles that uh, answer some of those, answer these two questions. If you want any more detail about the specific arguments I make, then you are welcome to go and read the papers, of course. So just a, a quick, so these are the articles. Um, the first one is uh, just should hear imminently from international peacekeeping about whether it's accepted, it's been revised and submitted, resubmitted some months ago. The second one is published in Civil Wars Journal already, so you can find it there. Um, third one is in Conflict <coughs> Security and Development, should be uh, online hopefully in the next few days, um, forthcoming in print in early 2020, and also um, the last one in Small Worlds and Insurgencies also. Um, I don't think they publish online, unfortunately, earlier, but it'll be um, out in March next year. But if you want them in advance, I can always supply them. So 
Just a quick note on uh, methods that I use for the research so that you're aware. Um, three major methods. Primary document analysis was mainly the text of a lot of ceasefire agreements and local uh, ceasefire agreements as well. Um, the secondary literature, obviously, scholarship of conflict resolution, complex political order, those kind of things. Uh, many policy, good, very good policy reports have been written um, on, this, on the Syrian civil war situation. Uh, news media, social media, often use these to triangulate <coughs> what was told to me in a series of 57 interviews, first-hand interviews that I did with um, three pools of people. So the first one was Syrians with first-hand knowledge of local dynamics. What does this mean? People that were actually either living uh, in ceasefire areas, often a little bit more than that though, they often were the ones who negotiate ceasefires. In the case of local truces, often that was the case. Judiciary members, um, local council members, medical workers in ceasefire areas, just for example. Members of cross-border organisations, this was a really interesting pool of people. So cross-border organisations are quite small Syrian organisations working usually in uh, Turkey, um, Lebanon and Jordan. I interviewed the ones in Lebanon and Jordan. They generally run by Syrians, very quite small, sort of in the vicinity of 10 to 15 uh, people. Usually they come from the area in Syria where they're basically supplying humanitarian aid and it's often governance projects that are, there, that are basically contracting to the larger aid suppliers like Save the Children, World Vision, people like that to directly supply um, humanitarian aid and sometimes governance, uh, education, other projects into uh, ceasefire areas in Syria. And then a pool of humanitarian and conflict experts who Actually, I mean, despite the fact that you would think uh, this group would be quite large, when you get down to quite specific topics, that group, um, the potential pool of people is actually not really that large. I mean, for example, for the last article, I wanted uh, experts that were uh, knew a lot about the Syrian-Russian relationship, and uh, that probably you can count those as, as a handful of kind of people. So um, <coughs> that kind of pool is not very large, and I interviewed 25 people of those. So the first article now, um, this article actually less about Syria but more trying to get to the heart of that first research question really, like what is a ceasefire really and does it only affect violence? So for this article I used an analysis of 186 ceasefire agreements, so the primary document analysis um, taken from the UN's database of ceasefires since the end of the Cold War and uh, Civil War conflicts. Um, asking is there a difference in these ceasefires and how they play out in practice. So essentially from reading all the text, I actually read the text of all these ceasefire agreements and basically came up with a type of typology that has four different types of ceasefires along two dimensions of the typology and basically the two dimensions are the specificity of the text of the agreement and the power disparity between the parties. And basically, um, every one of those 180 or so ceasefires that I read fits relatively neatly into one of those four categories. In the article then, it's kind of quite a conceptual article, I go on to hypothesise um, what areas beyond only violence those kind of, the different types of ceasefires might affect. So I'm going to give you two examples from the typology now. First of all, substantive uh, ceasefires. This is the, some of the text from the, um, the 2002 agreement, ceasefire agreement between the LTTE and the Sri Lankan government, actually. Don't need to read it all, but you can see um, immediately that the text is quite specific in nature when it comes to things like uh, troop separation. They've mentioned uh, a number of metres here. Um, they've got visiting rights and they've mentioned sort of a specific amount of days, they've mentioned uh, a specific road. Um, so in this way, uh, for me, I've classified this text as being quite specific, particularly when you compare it to something like this. This is the uh, from text from the ceasefire agreement between the Pakistani Taliban operating in the SWAT and the Pakistani government. So you can see in some of this text, it's not the whole text obviously, but you can see how the text differs from what I've called a substantive ceasefire. It's much more kind of general, it's much more aspirational uh, in nature, I think anyway. And I think 
what this means in practice is this kind of enables this aspirational text, kind of allows for broad uh, interpretation with the, for the needs of the actor with the most power in the situation. <coughs> so the power disparity is asymmetrical in the case of symbolic ceasefires, and it means that the side with the most power can essentially consolidate control over things like local governance, economic networks uh, like smuggling routes, for example, or even uh, how humanitarian aid is entering the area. On the other hand, the detailed wording of the, of the certain terms uh, could prevent signatories from modifying their military positions, for example, in the short term at least, which could make potentially for more stable outcomes because they're not open to being kind of uh, reinterpreted because the text is actually quite specific. So, in the case of substantive ceasefires, the power relations between the parties are much more symmetrical. Uh, and this might mean that uh, the parties that sign these kind of uh, detailed ceasefires have little appetite for further military expenditure. Therefore, they've invested quite a lot of time and effort to actually um, negotiate and come up with these quite detailed terms. And therefore, they might be willing to be held um, and to hold the other party to those terms as well, and much easier to hold uh, each other accountable because the terms are so specific. This stability, uh, in turn, might lead to the creation and consolidation of uh, rebel governance networks. That was certainly the case uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, it might lead to diplomatic endeavours, also the case with Sri Lanka, and funding from international uh, actors, because uh, the LTT at that stage could operate essentially quite freely on the international level. So that's just a bit of a broad overview of the first article. So now we're kind of going down into the nitty gritty of the Syrian civil war. We're kind of looking at, okay, if we're thinking about ceasefires and these diverse ramifications that they might have, um, what are some of those diverse ramifications in practice? And let's look at the empirics from Syria. So this is the second article in the series that was published uh, last year in Civil Wars. It looks, um, quite specifically at how the 2016 cessation of hostilities affected local governance institutions in the south of Syria, in Dara province, which is a province in the south of Syria that borders, borders Jordan, there it is on the map. Um, for this article, I interviewed quite a lot of those cross-border organisations, uh, people from those organisations that, um, that were working directly into the, this area. And also I interviewed a lot of um, members of um, civil society groups, uh, local councillors, um, judiciary from the area as well. So what I want to show you, I, it's not, um, this kind of, what I, these list of things gives you a sense of the kind of actors that were working in this area. Um, it's not really important that you understand um, the, the exact relationships between the groups. You can, you can read the article to get a sense of that because it's quite complex. But what this sort of shows you is these are some of the relationships before the ceasefire that I found, and after the ceasefire they, they change quite a bit. So it's always very hard to kind of establish direct causal relationship between a ceasefire and relationships in civil war, because obviously there's lots of things happening. But um, I think there was enough of those changes to warrant that at least ceasefires had some impact on this relationship change. Could you repeat that slide? Like go back and forth. We can try. Just the relationship one? Yeah. Sorry. You can read that article, Dara. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have already, actually. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of it now. Um, how they change, for example. So, and you'll see this um, in oral form, I guess. Um, so, what actually happened with the 2016 cessation of hostilities was that it did actually reduce, it was actually quite successful at reducing levels of violence, um, which was really interesting, actually. So, what it, what it did was it gave the regime the ability to focus its troops and its attention on other key strategic areas. So. It relocated troops away from Dara to target areas uh, and ultimately overtake them later that year, like Aleppo and Daraya. So it did that quite effectively. This is the kind of thing you would expect, in a way. Like a lot of literature suggests that ceasefires have these military consequences that allow troops to rearm, to uh, you know redeploy, remanoeuvre. So that's kind of, um, in a way, expected. 
what was really interesting was that because um, the Syrian regime moved out of this area of the south, another group that was affiliated with ISIS actually, uh, and the regime as well, started specifically targeting local governance uh, leaders. So they assassinated them essentially with targeted assassinations. So local council leaders, members of the judiciary, the head of the Syrian civil defence were all targeted by the ISIS affiliate and the regime, which was far less taxing on the regime's uh, military uh, efforts in that area, obviously. But it had obviously a really big effect on local governance. So the decrease in violence also changed and recalibrated the dynamics with other actors as well. And the tribal leaders were a big uh, part of kind of governance in the South, actually. They had quite a prominent role there. They enlarged, uh, during the ceasefire time, they enlarged and expanded the mandate of Ashura Council, actually. The Ashura was in, in existence even before the war. But the war kind of, um, and particularly the ceasefire, necessitated the enlargement of the Shura, not just to contain tribal leaders, but local council members as well, as a way to resolve local disputes. Smuggling routes uh, near the border with Jordan were open, well, the border with Jordan was again opened during the ceasefire because the violence had dropped, and then the smuggling routes kind of got reactivated. That actually caused, ironically, more disputes between some of the prominent tribal families there that controlled some of those smuggling routes. And then they needed the Shura Council again to mediate, mediate those disputes between uh, the large families. So I think the real takeaway is that far from operating in isolation and far from only reducing levels of violence, the ceasefire changed some of these linkages, it reinforced others. And, and I think the real takeaway is that it, it, these local actors exist in a very complex web of local alliances and contestations that need to be taken into account when thinking about how, what ceasefires affect. The next article uh, about to be published in Conflict Security and Development um, takes a, a, quite a radical view of ceasefires actually. It looks at local truce and reconciliation agreements in Syria and sees them um, actually these kind of local ceasefires not as being humanitarian or beneficial, kind of positive tools for reducing violence, even though they are very effective at reducing violence, but actually as really highly coercive um, and violent tools in and of themselves. So the article traces the trajectory of local ceasefires in Syria and shows how they're used by the Syrian regime, particularly to secure property rights and rights to territory and to triage the population of these rebel controlled areas into those that are able to rejoin the state and those that are, have essentially been exiled from the state. And it does this very cleverly, actually through the text of these uh, local ceasefire agreements. So I looked at the text of the local ceasefire agreements for this article and then I interviewed actually a lot of Syrians that had first-hand knowledge about negotiating these ceasefires um, and the cross-border organisation members again. So just to give you an overview, so local truces, they were called um, that in the early days of the uprising actually and they followed quite a set playbook. So first of all, a siege was put around a rebel-held community. <coughs> Although at this time of local truces, this siege was usually relatively loosely enforced. And what happened then was that the regime uh, would then bombard the area, and then it would come to some kind of local truce, a local ceasefire agreement with the uh, armed group or political leadership of the community. Usually this was in, in exchange for some kind of security arrangements around local resources. So often based around what was, about what was in the area. So in the case of Hula, which is a, a region in northern Homs Governorate, it contained a power station that, there, that was in rebel, sort of on the outskirts of rebel controlled area. And what would happen is when uh, the rebels would target that power station when they wanted the Syrian regime or when they thought the Syrian regime was not abiding by the terms of the truce agreement. For example, in letting humanitarian supplies into the area. In return, the government, the Syrian regime, would negotiate a truce with the community when they wanted the rocketing of the power station to stop, which because the power station was supplying uh, areas still within regime control. 
So what happened was these local truces morphed into what became euphemistically known as reconciliation agreements in uh, about August 2016 with the retaking of the rebel-held community of Dereya, which is on the outskirts of Damascus. So the ability of the Syrian regime to leverage these local truces into what became known as reconciliation agreements was basically brought about by Russia's uh, military involvement in the Syrian civil war. This is because uh, Russia's involvement allowed the regime to more tightly enforce those siege environments. It would then greatly ratchet up the pressure in terms of bombardment on these communities and basically force the leadership into signing what was effectively a very one-sided ceasefire deal known as a reconciliation agreement or what I've called in one of the articles a strangle contract. It's a contract in Europe that's known in Europe. Um, it's very one, a very highly asymmetrical contract where the part the party in the position of power essentially forces the terms on the other party, in this case the Syrian regime, on the rebel-held community. So there was virtually always a term in these reconciliation agreements that essentially translates to regularising one's status or reconciling one's status. So the term that supposedly offered the citizens or the people living in these rebel-held areas a choice about whether to stay or leave the area. But in reality, what happened was that anyone even half active in the rebellion, so this could mean medical personnel, the political leadership, so local council members, um, groups, um, judiciary, anyone politically involved in the rebellion and their families more or less had to choose to leave to rebel-held Idlib if they wanted to survive, essentially, when the regime came to take, retake control of the area. Those that chose to remain under the terms of the agreement must then go through an, quite invasive security checks um, enable that, to, in order to reconcile their status with the regime. So this allows the regime to uh, essentially find people that haven't uh, fulfilled their consumption duties and also this other level of security control. So for people that it doesn't deem worthy to rejoin the state, it can arrest them and detain them, all that involves in Syria. So essentially the terms of these ceasefire agreements um, enable the regime to retake control of property in these areas both territory and property, that gets resubsumed back into the state. And with the population, it triages them into what status Calabas, a political scientist, calls collaborators and defectors. So defectors choose to go to rebel held Italy because they have no ability to rejoin the state. And collaborators, those that think they might be able to pass a security uh, um, test, are able to rejoin the state albeit with highly diminished rights. So quite, <laughs> quite an ingenious uh, tool, actually, a very clever tool by the regime to reassert its rights in what has, you know, under the guise of reconciliation over both property and citizenship. The last article um, tries to link local and national dynamics or local and international dynamics through uh, the Astana peace process and particularly the creation of the four uh, de-escalation zones across uh, the territory of Syria. So it mainly uses, that's the interviews with the conflict experts I mentioned, particularly those ones looking at Syrian-Russian relationships, um, and it builds on a lot of this previous work. So the argument in this article is that before the civil war, the Syrian regime had almost unprecedented control and power over the territory of Syria, which we would kind of expect from a nation state, right? But during the war, in order to survive, what it did was it actually mortgaged some of its control to the actors that essentially negotiated the de-escalation zone agreement. So primarily Russia, um, Turkey and Iran. It also did, it's also kind of mortgaged some of that control to prominent individuals, particularly business individuals, often uh, militia leaders, sometimes the same thing. Um, 
who operated it, uh, often in these areas and they, they, uh, had, they, the regime devolved some of its power to them. So the three areas that I want to look at particularly, um, and I do so in the article, are the areas of diplomacy, security and territorial control and how uh, these different actors have a, are able to exercise control over these areas that really should be within the purview of the nation state. So my argument, so first of all, diplomacy, like quite simply, the Syrian regime wasn't a signatory to the de-escalation zone agreement. So therefore, in a way, Russia, uh, Turkey and Iran made this deal that actually was for over the Syrian territory, um, had ramifications for the Syrian territory, but the Syrian regime was never a signatory. Um, therefore, it really curta curtailed uh, Syrian diplomacy in, in its ability to influence events over its territory. Secondly, security, through a term rating, relating to the establishment and functioning of checkpoints and observation points on the perimeters of these de-escalation zones, Russia particularly augmented the presence of uh, its military police on the ground, allowing it a more granular level of control over local level dynamics. Russia also underwrites the Fifth Corps, which is an amalgamation of local paramilitary groups, and the National Defence Forces, again, come under Iranian leadership. So these big security apparatuses now operating in Syria are also controlled by external states. In terms of territory, um, and <laughs> excluding events of the last few days, in the creation of the de-escalation zone, Idlib became what one of my interviewees called the dumping ground for all those opposition and political, uh, the opposition figures, fighters, that were unable to reconcile under the terms of reconciliation agreements and had to go to Idlib. It also offered those elites come militia leaders that I mentioned to you a way of augmenting their authority and control in the spoils of, over the spoils of the other newly reconciled uh, three de-escalation zone areas. So under the terms of the de-escalation zone agreement, Turkey actually became the primary actor able to control and influence uh, the area of Idlib and particularly the two largest rebel groups operating there, the Syrian National Army and the one-time Al-Qaeda affiliate, Hayat Tadir al-Sham. In this way, Turkey now assumes large control over a big chunk of Syria's territory. And again, <laughs> not to mention now what it's doing in the northeast. I think these three areas present a new way of looking at the ramifications of an internationally negotiated ceasefire and how, they can, how, those, how a ceasefire may affect uh, levels of a nation state's supposed sovereignty. So I'm going to conclude now, Dara's giving me uh, the time uh, warning, getting back to those research questions that we started with. What, uh, what is a ceasefire? What, do we, what, what have we come up with at the end of uh, looking at this in these ways? So Hugo Brodius, the founding father of the laws of armed conflict, saw ceasefires as a temporary state of affairs. He wrote that during a ceasefire, there was no need for a new declaration of war to be made since the legal state of war was not dead, but sleeping. So it would be folly of me, I think, to suggest that Grotius is wrong. But what I think we can kind of imply from what he says and what might be a more apt way of thinking about ceasefires is that during this period of supposed sleep, a lot can actually happen just like it can when we're asleep. You know, we can dream, we can uh, move around, we can walk even. So ceasefires, rather than, they don't actually, well, they don't simply cease fire. They may reduce violence in some cases, but not always. So rather than being solely defined by their ability to reduce violence, a new definition that I propose is that they are the codification of a certain military and political state of affairs during wartime. And so what do I mean by that? By codification, I mean that it's kind of formalization. So the written terms provide a kind of formalization of an agreement between the parties. And what it contains, so the text of that agreement, has an effect on the power relations between a variety of actors at the time. And that has ramifications on the ground. And what are those ramifications? So 
mentioned lots of those already in the articles. Local governance efforts in uh, the south of Syria, economic networks such as smuggling routes and humanitarian access. Citizenship and property rights very clearly under the terms of local truces and reconciliation agreements and diplomacy, security and territorial control in the form of the de-escalation zones. Why does any of this matter? <laughs> As academics, maybe uh, you know, we like that our work has some kind of practical implications. And I think the practical implications for these kind of findings are this. Firstly, so that conflict negotiators can take more seriously these diverse ramifications of ceasefires when they negotiate them and they can think about how the text of the agreement may actually affect things beyond levels of violence. Policy makers can think about how their funding links in with these complex local dynamics and how peace processes, may, including ceasefires, might affect these local dynamics. Finally, humanitarian aid is increasingly, and particularly for the case in Syria, being politicised and a highly sought after commodity actually by a lot of actors in civil wars. And ceasefires play into these dynamics as well. Therefore, it's really important that humanitarian organisations and agencies think really carefully about how ceasefires are used and how they might affect their humanitarian aid and access. So just to conclude, I think what I've tried to argue in all these articles is that far from being benevolent, far from stopping violence, um, ceasefires in many cases are actually a tool of state building and they're used by different actors for their own kind of state building ends. As one of my interviewees, a Syrian, put it very eloquently, as only possibly a Syrian can, if there is a ceasefire, people know the devil is coming. Thanks. So much for Marie, that for what was not an optimistic uh, look at <laughs> ceasefires, but nonetheless, I think a call to arms, if you can say that, uh, for us to think more carefully about ceasefires and their, their many and varied effects in conflict. And um, I guess we tend to see ceasefires as a good thing, um, but perhaps in many complex situations, they uh, you know do huge damage. I'm going to open up to the floor for questions. Uh, yep. Thank you, Marika. Very, very interesting research, very comprehensive. And I enjoyed your style of uh, focusing on papers you have published, so we can look them up. So I'm basically focusing on your final sentence here. I'm wondering at the same time about tangible and intangible benefits of ceasefire agreements to all parties, including the non-state actors, because based on my experience in South Asia, I've seen that non-state actors often out of war fatigue or conflict fatigue, they opt for ceasefire agreements and they use that time in between to reassemble uh, their teams together, do more recruitment uh, and you know bring everyone sort of on board. So maybe, I don't know if you looked into this dimension. Um, yeah, well I think I mentioned, I mean the fatigue aspect is certainly might be a motivation in some cases. Um, I mean, the I would sort of broaden that to be the military aspect, and certainly in the paper on the cessation of hostilities, we saw how the regime very uh, e easily redeployed their troops uh, away from uh, you know, one ceasefire zone to another in order to retake it. So the military aspect, I'm certainly not saying, I mean, that's the conventional way of thinking about ceasefires for sure. And I'm definitely not saying <coughs> that's not important. That is important and it certainly happens. That's definitely my experience. The military aspect certainly happens. I guess what I'm saying is that there's all these other aspects that happen too that we also have to be um, aware of, or that we don't have to be aware of them, but I think people operating in conflict zones and dealing with conflict zones should be aware of them because there's many more actors other than the military actors, council members, judiciary, tribal leaders, all those kind of medical, humanitarian people that also are influenced by the ceasefire. Um, and so we should look at how ceasefires affect the different actors beyond the, medical, beyond the military level as well, yeah. Does any of our female guests have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Hi, so I was wondering, um, so I'm not familiar with the political science and international relations literature, but among those who are under indicated that you have um, have you found like a common thread 
terms of the, the short, short run and the long run impact of this ceasefire, and especially according to your classification, the most substantial one, are they actually having a more positive long run impact? Yeah. And if so, how does the Syrian case fit into those? I mean, there's no peace yet, of course, uh, but um, I was wondering how many ceasefires have been there? How does the Syrian case play in this bigger problem? Yeah, picture? yeah, thanks. It's Laura, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Laura. Um, yeah. So I look. So the two, so the two. I think I didn't give you examples for um, in terms of the typology. Um, are actually, the ones that I hypothesise are probably a, in a way have a much more of a timing element. So the interim ceasefires. Um, I I code them. Um, one of their basic features actually is that they include, their sort of raised in data actually, is that they include some sort of monitoring mechanism. And it's often the text is kind of based around this monitoring, monitoring mechanism. And it, it's not very specific in nature, the text, but it, it really puts this monitoring mechanism centre stage. And my hypothesis is that through these monitoring mechanisms, it's a really good way for um, actors to kind of play the time because they get this op optical win that they've actually made an agreement and aren't we great and aren't we good negotiators and we've compromised or, you know, they can, for their own um, constituents but also for the international stage. Um, but then often you see, like in a place like Myanmar or in a place like the Philippines, you see six, absolute succession of these interim agreements being made over the years that kind of don't really do anything, or they... No, that's not true. They, in many cases, they can kind of halt military um, operations, but they allow actually also a lot of those local dynamics to happen. Um, coercive ceasefires is what I would classify as um, those reconciliation agreements I mentioned. So, yeah, and so actually I think the substantive and the coercive ones actually probably provide... Um, well, coercive particularly, they probably provide for the most stable outcomes simply because they are almost like a victor's peace kind of thing. They're really a, an enforced um, agreement. I mean, they're a, they're a negotiated kind of ceasefire only in name, really. Um, I mean, maybe you could put, like, um, even the Basque uh, ETA, uh, even though it was a unilateral ceasefire declaration, I think you could probably argue that the power asymmetry was so great um, between the Spanish government and the Basque that it felt like it needed to do this declaration and then kind of was forced into just kind of disbanding, doing all those things that it did. So I think in a way, yeah, the coercive and potentially the substantive in the detailed terms provide um, for, potentially provide for the more longer term outcomes. Yeah, but obviously I haven't done a, a big enough survey, quantitatively speaking, to kind of say that with any assurity, I think. <laughs> I was just thinking of what you were, I was just thinking of, you know, great research idea, like, and because there's a big database, is a war, uh, you know, the conflict database. Yeah, war yeah. It's nice to match ceasefire, but to see if actually empirically there is an evidence that some types of ceasefire matter. Maybe yeah. The problem is with those databases, like the correlates of war or you know, pre some of those pre owned databases. Yeah. The problem for me is that they're measuring battle related deaths, which is often, which is an important marker, right? But the whole point of my argument, in a way, is that it's actually not all about the, the deaths and the violence. It's about these governance systems and about the relationships between parties and the hoarding of power. So the number of deaths, in a way, I guess, tells me rel relatively little about whether those other things are happening, I think. But if one could identify ceasefire when does it happen and then duration of war, I mean, the yeah. data, of course, it's, I mean, I'm familiar with this data because it's yeah. very noisy and I, I agree that, you know, one could look at, you know, that, do ceasefire really bring to peace, yes or no, just mm. looking at that. Does the ceasefire happen? Do we have another 10 years of war? Do we have another month of yeah. war? Yeah. Yeah, I think what it would be good from what you're saying um, is to see whether those categories map on to those databases. Yeah, I think that's a good project. Thank you. <laughs> so much work to do. Yeah. Um, Niamat had a question. Oh, thank you. Hello, Niamat. Uh, thank you for this fascinating research on ceasefire thing and, and, and thank you for the complexity of ceasefire, which you often see as something very positive. 
Um, the question uh, I have concerns the role of international actors, in particular the role of UN groups like the ICRC, because we often see them and hear them talk about ceasefire. Maybe they were also involved in negotiating some of these uh, ceasefires in Syria, for example, with the humanitarian access, mm. or in other places they might be just uh, monitoring. Uh, and the second one of this could be what would be the implications of your research in terms of their future role and approach towards negotiating with one of these is fine for this next year yeah. or probably Afghanistan. Not a big question at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not ambitious. Well, I think, you know, you probably know as well, you, you, you probably know the answer to that question already, really. Um, I mean, the UN obviously, um, it knows how it can be, like already from its activities in Sri Lanka and well before that as well, it knows very well how its role in peace negotiations can be politicised, and particularly as a, as a monitor. Um, in term, so I guess my research adds to their understanding of how it can be <laughs> politicised and how it potentially affects um, the UN. I mean, the UN's role in Syria um, I mean, I think it's had, I think it's navigated a really tr tricky environment badly. <laughs> and it hasn't, you know, institutionally, it hasn't processed any of those lessons from the past. Basically, the majority of aid um, is still delivered through Damascus. And that means that the regime has massive control over where and to who that aid is going. I mean, I read a report the other day that said, a little bit older report that said something like 75% of UN delivered aid, mainly through the UN Ultra system, is essentially, um, I, mean, I don't want to use the word tamper, but like it's not the original agreement that the UN had with the regime for delivery. 75%. Like, that's insane. And even the remaining 25% often um, uh, military people or militia leaders on the edges of the checkpoints of, of these uh, de-escalation zone areas or of reconciliated areas. Um, so on the regime side and on the rebel side, take their cash of <laughs> those humanitarian supplies. So I think the, the, the UN needs to it will obviously write some great reports and it probably already has about you know how aid has become politicized and used in this context but it, i mean it really has to learn i mean start to learn from those lessons and i mean that's just the problem of probably any big organization is that that institutional memory um from, from wars in afghanistan from wars in Sri Lanka that you know weren't actually that long ago and still continue uh, it's just not there and people just seem unwilling to take those lessons on board and think that they know how to do it and Syria is a completely different case and yes there might be unique things about it but I think you know institutions can be a lot better about recognising those dynamics. I mean another thing with Syria is that many NGOs um, weren't even granted registration, they had to go through a registration status with Damascus and that was very invasive um, and very hard to get for many NGOs, so they didn't um, they didn't do it, um, or they weren't able to complete it. So they're not even able to operate inside uh, government controlled areas in Syria. This then has ra massive ramifications for what's happening, obviously, in the northeast at the moment, um, because the regime's just made a control with the Syrian Democratic Forces, and you see like absolute exodus of these humanitarian organisations from that area because they cannot operate under regime control. So you've got this massive displacement of people, all completely in need of aid, <laughs> and sadly, a massive exodus of humanitarian organisations, the very ones that could be supplying them with that aid. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm actually just about to start a job with one of those. Okay. <laughs> um, in the is your, sorry, is your microphone oh, on? Is that better? Yes. yes. Um, and my question is kind of follow on of this for those NGOs and humanitarian actors who aren't on UN scale and aren't involved in those ceasefire negotiations except maybe low level advocacy. Mm. You mentioned earlier in your presentation the importance of making sure that 
these humanitarian agencies are maneuvering in a way that's that somehow has to balance between providing aid and doing their job, but also remaining impartial and neutral, which is kind of the basis of humanitarian work. Mm. How do you, or maybe some of the experts you talk to, or even the Syrians themselves, how do you, how do they, and how do you suggest that agencies mm. go about doing mm. that if they don't have the kind of pull or the you know, power to be involved in the negotiations themselves? Yeah. I mean, I've got a few ideas about that. I mean, I'll try and answer relatively briefly and then we can speak about it more if you like. So the first thing is I read a really great art, academic article the other day that was basically, and I think very um, very true, is that um, humanitarian organisations use these... They, and I don't mean to say it in a negative way, but they use these humanitarian principles... I mean, I, I didn't argue this, this article argued this, but I agree... They use the humanitarian principles as a kind of as a shield to protect them from criticism, and as a as as a and as they should as a guiding light to work work with or behind. The problem is that in an environment like Syria's and probably most civil war environments, I would imagine, it's very very hard to stick to those to to. Uh, operate in accordance with the letter of those humanitarian principles. So I think um, humani first, I think humanitarian organisations need to be a little bit more aware of how of 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 those conundrums, even for themselves, and not kind of just always go, oh, look, we're working according to neutrality. We're, we're working according to the principle of impartiality. Whatever the case. They need to be more self-critical and they need to also open themselves up to criticism more and not hide behind those principles um, so that they can better access, so that they can all actually better, you know, um, live, up to the, live up to the kind of the values of the humanitarian principles. So that's one. Um, in terms of, like, that environment, I mean, at a conference I was at recently, there was a lot of really interesting examples of... Um, what uh, people started calling micro ceasefires. So looking at, um, I wouldn't even call them ceasefires, I call them like lo micro agreements and probably Nimat knows a lot of those from Afghanistan as well and I think the examples were given from Afghanistan. It's where, for example, the ICRC negotiates agreement with a, I think in the example that they gave was with a, with the Taliban for a Taliban medic to, because he was the only doctor in a certain area, to, to actually be the doctor at a government controlled <laughs> medical facility because they needed people in that area to get medical, uh, medical attention. Um, and so I think, you know, but then, you know, <laughs> When, again, you come back to the principles, how does that work, I don't know. Um, but I think I, at the time I thought, and I still do think, is like in a way if, if the goal is to make a difference, you have to then, you know, to people's lives, then I think the best way to do it is to look at that really individual level and go how can we, not on this kind of international, national level, I mean other people are doing that, that's fine, to look really locally to understand those local dynamics and actually the, not even the actors like I've looked at. I mean, I've looked at judiciary, I've looked at local councils and I've spoken to members of those things, but to look at the actual people and to go, ah, oh, this is the doctor. This is the only doctor we've got in this 500 kilometre area. People need medical attention. Let's go to him and make a deal, you know, and to look at that. I mean, that's even granular beyond what I've done. So that would be a good tip. <laughs> it's actually a uh, really interesting new paper out um, from our Centre of Humanitarian Dialogue here at Deakin looking at whether the four principles of humanitarianism are still relevant in today's age. So it might be interesting. I think it's a working paper, so it's short. It's I think there's really a talk on it actually really soon. There is. Yeah, it's Maybe at Deakin downtown. Mm. Um, I think it's actually, this may be the, anyway, yeah, it's um, 
Yeah, we can send you the details. Yeah. Matthew Clark is the author. Yeah, it looked really good. Um, Abbas, you had a question. Thank you very much for the questions. I have uh, follow-up questions. First, as far as I understood from your representation, most of the ceasefire agreements they are not a precondition primary step for peace agreement. They are just for uh, buying time and for providing uh, services for people or just simply having opportunities for further preparedness for, for the war. So, for example, in the case of Pakistan, you uh, mentioned there was ceasefire, but then the ceasefire not lost so long and then the war started again. It was kind of opportunity, as Dr. Zaid mentioned, that the non such actors they prepared themselves for, for the next step of the, the war. So, uh, now, who, state or non state actors, who would benefit the most from this ceasefire? This is my first question, according to your research and experience, uh, research uh, about Syria related to the unification of the ceasefire. And the second, so because the ceasefire is not uh, result of peace, then for the next round, maybe they again need ceasefire negotiation. So how will it impact the trust between these parties? Will they be able to reach the ceasefire the next time and next time? Because it's more like a tactical process rather than a, a strategic approach to reaching peace. And uh, the, the third part, the third dimension of the question is that the use of the ceasefire, what does change on the ground in terms of switching sides between other actors and also provide opportunities for the uh, third actors that they are not part of the ceasefire to attack in the area and use the opportunity. And uh, finally, uh, how they implement the ceasefire agreement? Because two sides come to a ceasefire agreement, there is no third, part, third party to enforce the agreement and uh, judge who are right and who are right, who, who respect the agreement. So how they implement and how they understood the, the agreement terms and they implemented the terms that they acted correctly or to both sides be satisfied and time periods, and how do you define this time periods of the ceasefire? Thank you. Mm, good luck. So, <laughs> thanks. So thanks for your questions. Um, I'll try and answer as best I can, because there's a lot there. Um, We've got about three minutes. Okay, so, yes, <laughs> okay. so I think, the, in firstly you asked about who, who benefits from these ceasefires. And I think that links with what you're saying about you know, ceasefires are a tactical process. And I definitely think I definitely think that's the case. And what I think we have to though get our heads around is it's not is is the outcome of that tactical process. And so what the conventional literature and the conventional thinking has been with those with ceasefires is that the outcome of that process is one, a reduction in violence, and two potentially a peace agreement. And I think we need to get our heads around, or this is what I'm arguing anyway, is that the outcome, the tactical outcome of that of the ceasefire process for a range of different actors, and they can be state and non-state, and um, the binary is of course true, but uh, you know, within state and non-state there's a plethora of other actors. So state could be you know, militia leaders linked to the, the, the government, it could be business elites, on the non-state, it could be tribal leaders, uh, local council members, a range. And what um, none of, well, you know, potentially some of those want a reduction in violence. Potentially they don't because for militia leaders, they might love uh, that there's lots of violence because that means that they're, uh, the people within the militia can keep looting the areas that they are working in, for example. So we have to look at the what the outcome of the ceasefire wants to be for all those for different actors and that, of course that makes um, negotiating them and whoever is negotiating them uh, difficult but I think we need to take whoever is negotiating them whether that's the direct parties whether there's a third party monitor as was the case with many of the ceasefires that I looked at um, we need to better understand what that motivation is and it's and basically my argument is pretty simple it's not just reducing violence and it's certainly not just getting to a peace agreement and that can change in different situations but we have to look uh, beyond that kind of reasoning yeah great brilliant <laughs> that was really, oh we're going to go over to him. he's got the power <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry to be kind of 
uh, the group at lunch. <laughs> Very brave. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Marika. That was an amazing paper. And uh, so good to hear that it's all done with the thesis. So thank that's you. fantastic. Uh, I wonder if you could reflect on what's happening right now uh, between the student government and the Kurdish forces. And if you could apply your your analysis on ceasefire and what they mean to that to what's going on now. Mm. How do you how would you interpret what's happening right now? Um, I don't know if I'd put it in a ceasefire lens because they haven't, as far as I know, well, I mean, I guess it probably maybe this um, sort of reconciliation agreement lens um, between this, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the, their political um, leaders and the regime. Um, I, again, I mean, from what I understand about the text of the agreement, um, there's a, there's a term of this a latest agreement that says that the Syrian regime is going to move uh, troops in quite specifically into these areas um, in the northeast of Syria. So um, whether that falls then under a substantive ceasefire or a coercive kind of ceasefire, I think you know, it would depend on your reading of the Kurds and the regime, and uh, probably at the moment it's kind of this asymmetrical relationship because the Kurds don't really have much bargaining power when it comes to the regime um, at the moment because they're essentially um, being wiped out by Turkey from the other side. So potentially, if we were going to analyse it like this, it falls into that, which is what I've said already, is that these reconciliation type agreements are these kind of quite coercive agreements that people are forced into doing, they don't really want to, that then the power, more powerful party, in this case the regime, will take advantage of that situation, which for sure I think it will do. Um, I mean, there is no way the regime will move troops back into this area without retaking control of the area. Like, any kind of mention of that um, that I've seen on social media and such, I think, just completely fails to consider the nature of the regime. <laughs> nature of the regime itself, yeah. What an interesting time. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I think your thesis is in, very, I think you should be very confident of your thesis, but I do wish you all the best with your examination. I hope that it will come back soon. Um, please join me in thanking Marika for a scintillating hour.